guys, welcome to the Dead Horse Podcast. Uh, I'm your host Vivek, and with me are my co-hosts Tejas, hey, Ashwin, hey, and Arvind. Hello. Yeah, we have a full roster this week, so that's great. Uh, we're doing something a little different this week, as opposed to discussing what we've all been playing. We thought we'd change things up a bit and talk about uh, you know two pretty great role-playing game franchises and how they're different from each other and how they're kind of similar and why we why we like or dislike them. So we'll start off with the first one, which is uh, the Elder Scrolls series. We're not going to be discussing the first two Elder Scrolls games, just uh, Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim. So Arvind, you're a m- big Morrowind fan, so let's start with you. The, the Elder Scrolls for me has always been like about the open world aspect is probably the most appealing for me. And Morrowind especially because it allowed you a lot of freedom and like you could bypass certain quest lines and such and you and you weren't really like there was no objective on the minimap. That was another thing I liked. You had to read the journal and like get directions from other people. So like since I was forced to do that, like that felt yeah, that, that felt actually quite good because I was actually being forced to role play in a role playing game. You know, like that's a pretty unique concept, I feel. And well, these days. Yeah, and yeah, and at the same time, yeah, I don't think that that kind of thing would be even possible with Skyrim and Oblivion to a certain extent because Skyrim is like Skyrim like handholds you to a like really like not exactly handhold, but it points the way almost the entire time. You always have an objective marker at your screen. You have to go there, and I feel that objective marker kind of makes the things like more monotonous than they probably are because it's always like go to this cave, kill this bunch of dragon, and then like and the and it's always the same cave. Like I'm not sure. Apparently, Skyrim <laughs> was supposed to have much more custom content, but it's like the same layout, and there's always the exit that is like that drops you right at the entrance. So. <laughs> Yeah, like overall, well, I, my enjoyment of the Elder Scrolls would be in descending order of Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim. So, okay, uh, yeah, I think I like Oblivion more than Skyrim, but I, I don't know. I think the exploration element is still very, very alive in all three of those games, and I think it's the the best I've, the most fun I've had with exploring the world has been in Skyrim. Not just because the environments look the best in Skyrim, because technology, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also because. Uh, I think the one thing that they do well in Skyrim is the dragon killing part where you just you're roaming around the world and you see a dragon and suddenly you have to fight it. Yeah, but at the same time it does kind of devalue the entire dragon fighting thing when it's the 50th dragon you're fighting and mud crabs are killing the dragon instead of you. I mean, I think yeah. Yeah, because dragons scale to your level. So, yeah, like if you are level 10, then potentially like a giant can like pretty much like Wipe out in like dragon. two or three hits. Yeah, because at <laughs> level ten or so, I think yeah, like if if the, if a giant hits you, you are catapulted into the sky, right? You know what I want yeah, to do now that, is if that's is a bug or intended I, behavior. I'm not sure. What I want to do is lead a dragon to a giant and see if the physics bug happens, where the giant just smacks the dragon with the club and the dragon just goes through the skybox and you don't <laughs> see it, it just flies. Yeah, I, I think that's up. what Arvind was talking about. Like coming back to his point about about the game feeling like it's it's hand holding you and that you know that there's a very that it's always pointing you on where to go and the caves feeling similar could you also not make the argument and I'm just being contrary at this point that they did it because they they knew that they were hitting a wider market and not everybody likes you know not having an objective right so that could you know just be a reason yeah. for it to be there sure but i think yeah. the draw of those games no, but, at least yeah. for me like, has always been being able to explore this large world and not knowing exactly where to go yeah no but at the same time there's another thing where like since the design the quest designers know that the player will always have an objective marker they don't bother to add the full description so i cannot turn off the ui either via a mod or like via in game options which i don't know exist or not so I cannot do that because there's not enough directions oh. to actually uh, pinpoint a place uh, without the right. hard guiding you, which I think is a problem compared to Morrowind. Uh, tangentially, another thing that I don't like about Elder Scrolls in general, like except Morrowind, is that the plot is, it's not an RPG that's, that thinks that the almost. plot is what makes an RPG. Like what, like, for for in in oblivion and like to a large extent in skyrim it's all about like 
the rpg aspect is just focused on combat and and the different ways in you could ch- in which you can tackle them like you can wield magic you can wield swords and but like when it's when it comes to the plot like it's just a cup, a bunch of dialogue options and then the, the thing always happens in the same order unless it's like a side quest or whatever yeah but i think so that's uh, one thing i don't like about the direction in which elder scrolls is heading yeah i think they made a big shift from morrowind to oblivion and skyrim from focusing on a linear uh, mission driven plot to world building and i think they succeed and fail in interesting ways uh, the world building in oblivion is is pretty cool and i think the world building in skyrim is even better but they've done that really cool world building at the expense of character development there are no characters from skyrim or oblivion that really stick out and stay with you right it's more just the world in general yeah i mean you don't remember guild leader number 45 wait well, six, what did ashwin say whatever. ashwin you were saying something sir i was just asking if morovin had interesting characters uh, like yeah there were a couple of them like yeah like they, like i forget the guy's name but he's uh, supposed to be a kind of meta character which you can kill to bypass a large portion of the main quest i completely forgot the guy's name like but yeah i think morovin had the more interesting ca- like but it, they were not as memorable as the most interesting characters i can recite a lot of characters from deus ex like gunther helman jc denton paul denton that sort of thing but at the, but from the elder scrolls it's not you know that kind of thing yeah so related to what you were saying about world building uh, vivek what i wanted to say was that uh, ob- the province of tamriel in oblivion was uh, deliberately made to be more of a standard fantasy environment and the eccentric stuff from it was uh, removed and like i yeah. don't know why maybe it was to uh, target the broader market because like people get offended if the elves aren't tree huggers or whatever but <laughs> yeah okay yeah so that's a point like uh, the elder scrolls series has been consciously moving towards a, a more uh, should i say tolkien s uh interpretation of the older elder scrolls lore yeah okay But yeah okay yeah they're generally trying to go uh for more mass appeal and something that's a bit more recognizable by you know your average fantasy lover as compared to you know something like uh, morrowind strange and unique you could almost say but then you know that would obviously drive away a certain amount of people who you know wouldn't recognize it and therefore not be interested in interested in it immediately yeah i say that for sure all right let's let's bring in the second franchise we want to talk about because i think the thing that we wanted to do in this uh, podcast is compare and contrast the both these series so the second series we're talking about is mass effect i think the person out here who's most recently finished mass effect is ashwin So Ashwin your thoughts on the series as a whole and what you like and dislike about it Well um Mass Effect is a complete I don't even think you can really compare these two because other than the fact that both these series are RPGs I think the the comparisons end there right the there's absolutely no open worldish element to Mass Effect as far as I can say It's a typical Bioware game. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> that is true. That is true. It is a very typical Bioware game. It follows yeah. the Bioware template from beginning to end. At the I same time, are... Mass Effect kind of established the whole Bioware template because earlier they were Bioware games were like uh, Baldur's Gate 2, Dragon Age, that kind of thing. But Mass Effect sort of was their uh, defined their template for the modern console generation. You know. Yeah. It felt a lot like virtual sequel to Koto. That to me. The, the the same idea of traveling companions and you on this huge quest admittedly that's very nifty game but i felt photo established the template more or less but that's just me yeah uh, i i think that's been every bioware game from you know uh, baldur's gate to dragon age to jade empire to you know not necessarily in chronological order any of those but that that's been their template and but yeah uh, arvin's right in the sense that I think more people started playing BioWare games because of Mass Effect. Uh but what I wanted to compare was not necessarily, you know, the games side by side. Yes, they look like completely separate games, but there are elements in both games that I wanted to discuss like the exploration in Mass Effect and the exploration in Elder Scrolls. Both are completely different, but they're interesting systems in their own and like I think as designers as game developers we should discuss what they get right, what they get wrong. Not just exploration, combat of course. 
exploration wise what yeah, must it does uh, is they encourage you to go from planet to planet and you get side quests on some planets which don't necessarily have anything to do with the main plot and the second mass effect they added the the mining game which uh, i think is the bane of all game players of that franchise <laughs> no one enjoyed that game, mini game yeah. uh, and scanning and, yeah go ahead i can only assume that was a uh, like that was a ploy to get the sims players interested in mass effect <laughs> not sure like, because it oh. was uh, no but at the oh. no, but at the same time exploration in mass effect 1 was probably the the only thing that can probably be compared to exploration in elder, elder scrolls because yeah. you can have a direct face to face comparison between mass effect 1 and elder scrolls in terms of exploration at least yeah because there are uh, randomly generated planets which i actually did not find that bad to be honest because it gave me a real sense of scale because yeah uh, like i could actually roam the galaxy it was not like i was clicking stuff on an atlas of the milky way kind of thing yeah no, but yeah but that's the problem like the later mass effects do lose a lot of that uh, sense of uh, of this scale of actually of being in the whole universe and like tra- or the whole galaxy and like traveling from one place to another that kind of stuff which i really uh, think that i think yeah that's another thing which is kind of weird about uh, mass effect as a whole as in like whatever criticism bioware received for their stuff they just dropped all of it instead of like iterating on stuff like and making it better uh, yeah like mass effect's one's inventory was kind of uh, awkward to use but at the same time uh like the bare bones upgrade management system in 2 was maybe a step too far in the other direction yeah so that was kind of weird like i don't know what it it was like taking the, their ball and going home you know instead of like yeah. trying to improve they're just like yeah whatever for sure they try to overcompensate that is true but i, I think they just made entirely different games like mass effect 1 was an rpg but i would call mass effect 3 a shooter that's what it was i would agree i would agree mass effect 3 is a very competent uh, third person cover shooter with minimalistic rpg elements uh, i think this is a trend we're seeing with uh, the two new franchises where you know with each iteration they're trying to do something a little bit new but not really you know sell that aspect of it you know because they know there's going to be pushback because i mean look at what they did with dragon age 1 to 2 you know in a way they were experimenting you know they wanted to see if you know that would work and it go over well you know it didn't <laughs> but like it, it didn't yeah but like imagine if they did something that did go over well it, people would like it even more it, it's just the fact that the choices they made aren't exactly what people have appreciated that's all so in a way i kind of can get behind them trying new stuff though i would rather they try new stuff in a new ip rather than just try different versions in a sa- uh, in an existing ip especially when the first uh first game in that ip was like so uh, well, so solid uh what i think is every time a game releases the general mentality becomes to find a bigger audience next time so instead yeah. of actually improving the elements of the game they are like okay what's the next bigger audience that actually plays games so mass so mass effect one was like okay we have a bit in common with third person shooters and hey gears of war sells a lot right so yeah, so like, let's try to make mass effect 2 a lot more like gears of war and like remove all that crappy rpg stuff that only weeboos play or whatever so and that ea acquired by the right Yeah, yeah acquired that, that is around Mass Effect One. I, I think just after Mass Effect yeah. One came out, he acquired Bioware. Yeah, right. It happens all over Mass Effect Two. Trust me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm fairly certain that made a huge difference to what Mass Effect Two was going to be. Uh, but, yeah. In fact, like all of their uh, missteps and su- like stuff, like Dragon Age Two and Mass Effect Two and Three, like all of those, pretty much came after the like after EA bought them, pretty much. After the acquisition, yeah. Yeah. getting back to comparing mass effect to the elder scrolls series i think <laughs> the cool thing about the exploration especially in you know oblivion and skyrim and morrowind is i think that's what makes those three games that you have to explore a large world where you don't know what you're going to see behind every corner i think yeah arvin made a point earlier that it's become kind of predictable you know when you walk into a cave you know where you're going to go and what you're going to see inside it it's not as unpredictable as it used to be but i still think 
Skyrim and uh, Oblivion build themselves around exploration, whereas Mass Effect builds itself around narrative. I think those are the two like key differences between them as as RPGs and as games. There's that. There's that, but I also believe that it, it's also, you know, the feel you get from the exploration. I mean, with uh, with the Elder Scrolls, you know, you're walking around and it's that, you know, frontiersman sort of uh, exploration feel where, you know, oh, wow, I found something new. Whereas with, um, with, with something like uh, Mass Effect, it's more like, not that necessarily I found something new, but I more content. And it's not a bad thing, it's just a different sort of rush that you get. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I also think in terms of direct mechanics, when you compare, when you have a side-by-side comparison of uh, Mass Effect and uh, Oblivion, uh, Mass Effect and the Elder Scrolls series, I keep I keep confusing Elder Scrolls with Oblivion for some reason. Uh, I think when you when you hold a series side-by-side in terms of combat mechanics, that's where I think Mass Effect kind of beats out Elder Scrolls a little bit. Uh, at least Skyrim, I think, Mass Effect, Two and three beat out Skyrim in terms of pure combat mechanics. But that's like saying you are more free speech oriented than than China. So like it's not really a compliment <laughs> oh, to say that you have better wow. combat than. Oh wow! Uh, the Elder Scrolls. That's series. the analogy you. That's the analogy you decided to make. <laughs> right. That's what you went with, Arvind. Free speech. Okay. Okay. Ashwin, you were. <laughs> yeah, Mass Effect One, in fact, had some tactical combat, which is refreshingly new. And I'm not sure if that is not there in the rest of the games in that series. I wonder if any of the was there any real tactics to the Elder Scrolls games combat? Um, yeah. there is a little bit, but I would mostly say that it's you know hit it till it dies. Yeah, I mean the tactics for me involve finding which spell is uh, badly broken and overpowered, and then putting all my skill points into that pretty much i think the strategy you yeah, use in the, in the elder scrolls games is kiting that is the strategy hit it strafe hit it strafe hit yeah. it strafe it dies yeah loop yeah. it strafe and like go for the next one huh. <laughs> that, yeah. that's more or less much. you know you, yeah, you master the yeah, art like, of running backwards yeah <laughs> yeah like for me at least like uh, i prefer to have like a, a bunch of spells and stuff it's very hard to balance like whatever it's like six or seven elements and like a bunch of spells. So it's pretty hard to balance that. So, I, so this, there is pretty much a, a dominant strategy involved there. So after which right. you don't really have to bother with the combat, just like click on it and it dies, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think another uh, difference is kind of how they approach their world bu- building through their uh, narrative is with Elder Scrolls, one thing I've noticed, especially because I've been playing Oblivion uh, recently, is that a lot of the times, a lot of times when you talk to people, the conversations that they have, especially in side quests or even just random dialogue, is very normal. You know, they talk about uh, just normal things and that kind of gives it a a little bit more believability. Whereas with a lot of Bioware games, especially Mass Effect, you you get this, like, every conversation almost feels like an info dump because they have this, you know, giant amount amount of back lore, uh, of uh, back history and lore, and everybody needs to tell you it just so that you know. Yeah, I think the, dif- the difference also is is that the Mass Effect games, the stakes are much higher than... I, I, yeah, the stakes are right. high in Oblivion and Skyrim, but Mass Effect, it's, it feels more immediate. Oblivion, it's like, yeah. oh, the world is about to end, but I can go around and maybe kill this bear and take its pet. Uh, Mass yeah. Effect um. is, the, the universe is ending, I need to do something now. Go ahead. Yeah, Arun. but at the same time, the Mass Effect games, like especially 2 and like 3 to a certain extent, Involve like min maxing all your uh, global variables. Like, I don't know what to call them. Like in Mass Effect 2, you need to perform the loyalty mission of every single person to ensure that they are like at maximum efficiency in their uh, in the suicide mission. And then in and 3, you have to collect. Yeah, and like they collect the you collect the battle assets and such. So yeah, that that is kind of weird because. Like at some point, I'm de- I'm dealing with Miranda, like Miranda's sister issues and Jacob's daddy issues, while like there's supposed to be the collector base thing that's going on. Yes. So I so I like so I don't think it Mass Effect is more immediate. I think that's a problem all RPGs with side quests, 
have pretty much in that like the immediacy is lost because of all this extra co- content the developers had to add or they would get like one star reviews on metacritic uh this is actually uh, sort of related to an article which i found about it was the writer of world war z and another movie which i forget but what he basically says is that if you if your plot uh, starts with the idea of that you have to save the world then you are pretty limited in terms of what you can do with the whole setting and such yeah and i think that's a problem a lot of role playing games have and in that it it just ends up being about saving the world so there's not a lot of stuff you can do with that framework in general i think the writer is damon lindelof who also wrote lost which makes everything you just mm-hmm. said very funny and <laughs> related non video yeah. game related context so uh, but yeah i read that interview it's a good interview in terms of you know how how hollywood completely changes the direction of your script if if it's about something they'll even if it's not about saving the world they'll make it about that because high stakes are important to get an audience uh, to empathize anyway coming to coming to where i think mass for a lot of people at least even if not necessarily for present company uh mass effect shines the place where mass effect shines is its narrative and the person who's most recently finished finished it is ashwin So I feel like what did you think from Mass Effect 1 to 2 to 3 what did you think about how the narrative flowed and you know what was your experience like without end what did you think of the ending well, Don't give me started on the ending lick <laughs> <laughs> I'm attempting yeah, the ending started on the ending yeah. Ashwin <laughs> Nice troll nice troll yeah <laughs> uh, But but uh, no, seriously what did you think about the narrative of like the three games and you know uh, I, I was especially unlucky with the ending. I did not play Day Zero. I played it after they came out with the extended cut, and turns out the ending I got is even worse than the original ending. I don't want to spoil it for anybody. I don't know. But you can spoil it. It's fine. Spoil it. Yeah, you can spoil it. It's pretty old. Yeah. I just decided. I just see the star child. That's what they call him, right? The yeah, yeah. The star standing there. So I. This this bugger has put me through so much grief, so I couldn't resist taking my gun and shooting him. And then, <laughs> and then exactly twenty seconds of the game, and it's over. <laughs> yeah, and and it is to be noted that uh, like reason. before the extended cut, uh, shooting the the kid did not have any effect. Like yeah. it was after the extended cut where BioWare. Uh, apparently saw youtube they looked at youtube and like found that everyone was shooting in this kid yeah <laughs> so then they changed it to and like who the, they thought whom they probably thought no one would shoot because it's the kid who shows up in all your dreams so now you have an emotional attachment you've seen this kid die yeah, like prospect. like this was such a basic writing mistake that i don't know how like the people of bioware made it like just because you show a uh, like a white blonde anglo saxon kid in your dreams doesn't mean the audience automatically empathizes with <laughs> like that kid like that's just insane it's like it's like the laziest uh, thing i can imagine like to get the audience to um, to think about something it's like hey here's a kid yeah this kid thinks you're bad if you don't think about this so like that's just yeah like yeah i think i yeah, think that, definitely you cared more about your crew members from mass effect 2 dying in that game yeah. than you did about that child yeah like exactly. in fact like I think it might have been more effective to have like maybe that one crew member which uh, died like you had to choose between Kaden and uh, like the racist lady right at one point yeah the speechless the racist lady, lady or whatever <laughs> yeah yeah so it would have been more appropriate to get the uh, the one who died from them in the yeah. like I don't know like I think much I... anyone would be more appropriate like uh, like get I don't know Nelson Mandela or something to appear in your dream. <laughs> Yeah, you just get anyone else. Good, yeah. sure. Yeah, Nelson Mandela. Yeah, is he the pattern? Race is all over <laughs> Arvind's analogies today, from you know white Anglo-Saxon children to Nelson Mandela. <laughs> I know he, he's kind of on a roll here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, but yeah, uh, Ashwin, go ahead. Like Mass Effect. What did you think? What did you think of the series? Well, um, I started with Mass Effect, then it came out, and I immediately, I was immediately put off. I shut the game, didn't play it because of guess what? The cover mechanics of the first game. <laughs> I was so proud of it that I didn't revisit it for a long time. Then I came back and then I found out that it was really good. Characters I could identify with, a very rich world, 
plus excellent tactical combat. Uh, I ended the game on a high, then moved on to Mass Effect 2. They actually managed to make Mass Effect 2 look worse than Mass Effect 1. I'm still not sure how they did that. It looked quite terrible, frankly. And then that, ge- that game didn't impress me much at all, Mass Effect 2. And then I thought, let's just finish this story once and for all, and then I went on to Mass Effect 3. And then I was pleasantly surprised. So this was a completely different game, a different genre, not an RPG, cover shooter. But they had done it well. They yeah they they did uh, things differently. For example, uh, like you mentioned earlier, the scale in Mass Effect One was from the exploration. The scale in Mass Effect Three was from uh, a sense of impending do- impending doom that the Reapers were attacking you from all corners and besieging you. So that was a different way of emphasizing the scale of the galaxy. That yeah. even such a potent force as the Reapers couldn't take it in one go. They had to slowly. It was a war of attrition at one point, right? So, yeah. that was a pretty clever thing for them to do. And they uh, executed it quite well, the cinematics. The big battle scene. Oh, yes. Then I remember, if you remember that, that moon, the Turian moon, I think it's called Paladin. Yeah, yeah that part moon. is amazing. Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. The, the huge open battlefields, the level design was terrific. The level design never really impressed me in the earlier Mass Effect games. But in 3, it was, yeah, it was really impressive. Uh, it's the first time I was bowled over by the level design in that series, Exactly, yeah. Two then, was when I saw shoulder high walls everywhere. I'm like, okay, I know there's going to be a fight here now. Three was less yeah. predictable, I feel, in, in, in those two, terms at least. Two, the only part I remember which had uh, challenging combat was when the collectors would attack you from uh, platforms, moving platforms. Those yeah. were well done, but that's the only thing I remember about two. Yeah, that's when you're inside the collector ship, I think. Yeah, they have these moving platforms uh, yeah. which might be above you or below you. Yeah. So which meant which added an extra element to the tactic, tactical combat. Yeah, for sure. I, I like. Yeah, yeah, then you yeah. fought uh, like a Terminator. Yeah. So that was the made from human <laughs> yeah. babies. Or, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that part was bad. I would have liked to play the game like the trilogy that Mass Effect One was hinting at instead of what we actually got, because a lot of stuff was just like. It was just so scaled down. It felt like a, like a studio has started out on a high, but then they thought that, no, they are, this approach isn't going to get us the money we want. So they were like, yeah, let's just gut this to... Because like having just a set of corridors where you explore that does hurt the scale of the universe a lot. It, it feels like the set of a TV show more than a like a universe. Another thing about the narrative of 3, which I did not like was the replacing of the people who died with identical but of a different name people for example grunt gets replaced with a person who's basically grunt but named something else and like the rachni queen who's supposed to be like the final rachni queen or whatever she gets replaced by an identical rachni queen that somehow appeared from a plot hole i imagine like a plot <laughs> hole from an, another dimension yeah and like yeah that <laughs> Yeah, that part I don't, yeah, I particularly hated that part. Like, I think even more than the ending, which is like saying something, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, it's it boiled down all your, all your actions to basically nothing, you know, which I did not like. Yeah. I think... A similar complaint about Mass Effect 2. I, I didn't interest at all. And in the end, I lost all, all my crew members because I did not upgrade my ship. I had oh, no yeah. clue that was coming. Yeah, they, they kind of, they don't really sell the upgrading the ship thing throughout the game because there's no ship-to-ship combat and suddenly in the end, uh, if you've not upgraded your ship, every like a shitload of people die in that suicide, in a cutscene in that suicide mission that you don't think you have any control over. Until later on, you go read a forum and realize, oh no, this this was because I made a mistake that I didn't know I could make. Exactly. I remember coming over to you and talking to you is this how it's supposed to be? Almost all the people died. Then you tell me that no, you were supposed to have upgraded your ship. <laughs> yeah, they don't telegraph that yeah. at all. It's it's something no. that's just it's a system that's underlying. I think there was a plan to have ship to ship combat in Mass Effect 2, but because of deadlines, they couldn't put it in there in time. That would be news to me because I don't like apart from like you you moving the ship manually with the cursor. I don't think there's much in the code to suggest. That there no, was there, there was there was a plan combat. for ship to ship combat because you if you ever go to one of the hangars you see a ship there and that was supposed to replace your car and there was supposed to be like space battles in Mass Effect 2 but that got taken out later on I think like 
because they they reached a point in development where EA said you can't ship this. We need to hit this ship date, guys. So Bioware had to take it out. Stop. Yeah, looks like that feature jumped ship. <laughs> oh my yeah. god. I- <laughs> oh god the outro I guess that just... was I guess that was the old ship moment oh god okay uh, that's guy, it I'm out I'll see you guys next week been... what I would ask you guys earlier was uh have you heard of the indoctrination theory you know it's right it, I was yeah. wondering what your thoughts on that were uh yeah I think it's it's a mostly like an over optimistic uh, kind of thing where like fans try to justify like all the bad writing decisions by were made because like <laughs> syndrome the... of uh Paranoid yeah. video game theories. Yeah, because I remember that the extended cut pretty much uh, like dashed all of the hopes of the indoctrination theory ever being true. Yeah. And like also a, a bunch of like uh, statements from by Bio- certain Bioware writers. Like I don't remember their names at all. But yeah, at some point Bioware went out and said like, no, that like this is not the indoctrination theory that 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 kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Uh, Ashwin, do you know I- what the indoctrination theory is? I really, yeah, I remember reading about it, but it didn't seem convincing enough, so I just crashed it. Okay, okay. This yeah. is about the color coding and all, right? It's That's partially it. I think the main thing is that Shepard is indoctrinated the whole time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, n- nothing, it, it's basically kind of a way to retcon everything that happens in that ending. <laughs> nothing actually happened. Because Shepard yeah. is things because he's indoctrinated. Yeah, it's like it was, it was a dream. Yeah, that's what the ending is pretty much, yeah. Uh, and somehow people th- think that's better than the actual ending. So that says a lot. No, I think yeah, it is better than the actual ending. At oh, least. it is better than the actual is better than, Anything is better <laughs> than the actual ending. Yeah. I think the, the other weird thing about Mass Effect as a series, at least in a narrative sense, is that the first game is the only game to have a strong villain. I mean, from a player point of view, yeah. meta point of view, yeah. Star Child is the biggest villain in all video games ever. But that's for a se- separate reasons that has nothing to do with narrative. Uh, but yeah, Saren, Saren is a good, really good villain. Yeah, and and at the same time, yeah, what Saren does is kind of believable if you like look at it, and especially like the in the investigation from the start, if you look at it objectively, you don't really have that much of a proof against Saren. It's like just a voice recording and a and like a tenuous witness at best. You see him kill the other Spectre, right? Yeah. That's no, I mean, it. I don't right think in you, the beginning. Yeah, the player sees it, but like the characters in the plot don't see it. Yeah, yeah. Only that guy who was sleeping behind the crates sees it, I think. Yeah. Like, there was this one guy, right, who was sleeping behind the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. That, yeah. yeah, that was kind of funny too because like is, from the distance where you hear Saren's gunshot, like somebody calculated that the gun would have been so loud that it would have. Destroyed the sleeping guy's eardrums <laughs> and killed him because you hear it from way out. Like it's like this boom gunshot. That so yeah, that yeah. I found that bit funny. Yeah. I don't know why they did this, but they go from a good villain in one to no villain in two, and a really really irritating. It's it's a it's a villain you hate, but uh, you hate it for all the wrong reasons in three. And at no, I think yeah, two suffered because they forced you to work for Cerebrus, an organization which. Let me remind you, in Mass Effect 1, fed humans to a Thresher Maw in order to test the effects of feeding humans to a, tre- to a Thresher Maw. <laughs> yeah, so that's the level of yeah. uh, like organizational planning we are talking about here. So, so yeah, and, and, you, and every other character in the universe slags you off for working for Cerebrus. And all the time you're like, I don't have an option. The plot has railroaded me into working for Cerebrus. So it's like the writers putting you in a bad position then laughing at you for doing it for yeah well for they, do kind of telegraph, they do kind of telegraph Cerberus being evil because just because of the place where elusive the elusive man is sitting throughout the view from yeah, the elusive it's... man's office is ridiculous it has it's gone yeah. with it written all over nice. <laughs> yeah i think yeah that's the kind of vibe they were going with yeah like bond villain style and like i i like to pretend that the elusive man is a metaphor for ea ruining the the Mass Effect plot and mechanics and stuff, oh. but like that's just my fan theory at the moment. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ashwin, go ahead. We are off at the bar. Yeah. Now that you remind me, the view from the elusive man's office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> it is like. Uh, Either it can't be that bad. It can't be that it's terrifying. Not, it's not as spectacular. Hey, you never know. It's in orbit next door, so. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I like to pretend that the elusive man just has a big screen saver on his background and he's trying to look intimidating. <laughs> well, actually, it's just a big screen. Yeah. Uh, if they do the Avengers joke where the elusive man is just playing Pac-Man or something, while everyone else thinks, where he thinks everyone else is not looking. <laughs> <laughs> That would be pretty awesome, actually. You know, you just walk into his room and suddenly, you know, you see Pac-Man switch off, replaced by that epic view. No, the screensaver. Yes, the screensaver. <laughs> yeah, and then it shifts to the old Windows screensaver with little star dots. Oh, Something about in 3D. Elusive man. Elusive man. All right. Uh, so I think that ties up what we think about Ma- the Mass Effect series in a pretty, not neat, but in a bow of some sort. I think we've covered what we think about Elder Scrolls and Mass Effect. They don't exactly gel, but... I like Elder Scrolls personally more than I like Mass Effect. I like both for different reasons and for different aspects, so I can't really peg one over the other. I can say I tried modeling. I go. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm attracted by different things in games, and I need a strong narrative for me to be hooked into the game, or it has to be gameplay. Roleplay doesn't seem to interest me as much. So I've right. been a fan of those games. Mass Effect, yes, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I. I, I can't really, co- like, for me, they are just so different games that I cannot really compare them. And, uh, like, both of the series' latest in- installments left me with, like, with some sort of disappointment. So, to be, like, I'm not really keen on either of them. But, yeah, like, I'm a big fan of, like, Morrowind and uh, Mass Effect 1. So, yeah, like, yeah, they're they are both good games. And, like, yeah, they both uh, embody different approaches to... A uh, role Making playing, like to crafting a role playing game. Yeah. Yeah. I For mean, sure. the whole, yeah, the whole comparison thing was a ham fisted thing anyway. So, yeah. It wasn't that ham fisted. You're ham fisted. <laughs> 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 uh. <laughs> all right, all right. Moving on, moving on from video games to news. Uh, news this week. There was a small controversy this week over one of Total Biscuits' uh, videos of a game called Day One Gary's Incident getting pulled off because the developers of that game, uh, does anyone know their name? Wild yeah. Games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wild Game Studios, the developer of Day One Gary's Incident decided to file a copyright infringement complaint against uh, the review that Total Biscuit did. Well, not a review. He calls them WTF is, like, what the fuck is? is they what are let's, is let's that plays, one? basically. Yeah, they're let's, let's plays. Let's, let's play. Yeah. That, that can occasionally be scathing. Uh, so, the yeah. developer filed what what he they said was a, a what is it called is it a copyright infringement claim saying that you're using content from our game yeah. without permission so YouTube pulled the video because of uh, regulations that that exist regarding copyrighted content. Yeah, I mean it is worth noting that uh, this is not a DCMA request which is like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This is a system YouTube has put in to make sure that it doesn't receive DCMA requests. Yeah. So what this uh, does is is it is very biased in the favor of the person filing the complaint. So at the moment, uh, a person can file a complaint for little to no for no penalty, pretty much. Like if I keep filing false complaints and like I I happen to be a huge corporation, like nothing will happen to me. Like yeah. And I think this was highlighted by uh, like Sega pulling uh, Shining Force. Uh, yeah, and they did it purely to increase their search ratings, which is like pretty... Well, like they did it because they were coming out with a new yeah. Shining Force game, and they wanted yeah. uh, people to look at the new one as opposed to the old one. So for some reason, they filed, I think, for a... They filed copyright infringement claims on a bunch of Shining Force videos, and got a bunch of those videos for no, I think channels. I saw that the reaction video of Total Biscuit for this, as in the reply video, and he was say. Uh, according to his stats, around half of the YouTube channels that Sega filed a claim against remain closed to this day. So basically, the famous YouTubers were able to uh, protest and make and make noise enough to get out of this. But like the smaller shows and stuff, they are at like at the point at this moment still uh, their channels are closed. So that well, is not the channel, like, but those videos are taken off. Not the I don't know the channels were closed because of this. Those videos were taken. Yeah, it's also a kind of yeah, like a three strike system. So I'm not sure if uh, I remember seeing a bunch of uh, like he listed a bunch of channels that were still closed to this day, like the entire channels. Huh. So I'm not sure like what exactly Sega did there. All right, Ashwin, go ahead. I think it's pretty well known. YouTube has a very strict policy where I think it's three three copyright infringement games and your channel is gone. Yeah. yeah. I remember this happened 
yeah. a couple of cricket broadcasting channels they would put up clips and the bcci sued them via youtube and they got blocked permanently so it's kind of risky yeah and yeah that's the problem with google as in like you don't get a human to talk to unless you happen to like make a uh, like so much noise that it starts getting bad press so uh, that's the point where google yeah. will dispatch a human from their hq yeah to uh, talk to you i think the video is the total biscuits video is back up now i think after the amount of noise that they made the developer yeah. had no choice but to like cave in uh, just for the sake of giving the developer side uh, the developer posted in the steam community hub of day one garage incident the lead developer and i think the owner of the studio posted that the reason yeah. that they had asked the video to be removed was because they didn't want total biscuit to make uh, money off their uh, copyrighted content which i think a lot of people are, don't necessarily find uh, you know to be true because there are other reviews that have been posted yeah. of the same game that uh, you yeah. know that are making money there are their ad based reviews that are making money yeah that have been asked to that no kick, copyright claim has been filed or youtube hasn't removed those videos uh the reason total biscuit's video got removed was because he's immensely popular and you know yeah. he has a lot of followers and a lot of developers are scared of getting bad reviews which to an extent is understandable but i think once you put a game out there uh, it's there's really no control you have over what happens next and and yeah, yeah at the same time like bad reviews can also get a bunch of press like i remember like total biscuit made a video of bad rats and now it's become like almost like a meme to gift bad rats to somebody for no reason so it's so bad reviews can often be beneficial as well so yeah but that's rare and you know it is a massive yeah. risk to uh give your content to a bunch of reviewers you know if they don't uh you know review it favorably and let's say they really you know uh shit on it then that that's a massive sales drop for uh developers and you also have to bear in mind that the way or the things that one de- uh one reviewer looks for is not exactly what another or what certain type of players will look for either so that but makes that's a, a that makes a big difference yeah, yeah it is i mean it, the it, alternative it is, is risk, to no doubt. yeah i mean the alternative is that nobody hears about your game so yeah that's just as yeah. bad i think but yeah they it's, finish your point yeah my, my point is basically it is not that you know there is a right or wrong way but just that it is generally a, uh, an area that's kind of fraught with a lot of peril for both sides uh really yeah. because uh you know the reviewers have to say something you know well i won't say controversial but they have to do something interesting to get people to look at what they do right i mean yeah. uh look at uh, yatsi he's built his career off of you know being eloquent but also shitting on games um conversely the people who make the games they need the press but for them they need decent press or good press so that people will at least consider buying their game yeah. you know the the moment uh, any ma- you know major uh, company says something bad about it when somebody is curious in google search is the first two lines is what they get and the first two lines are either going to be really positive or really negative and that's 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 a little too binary almost I think another thing that developers are scared of especially now in the age of let's play and youtube channels becoming massively popular is that a lot of critics are quasi celebrities in the video games industry and yeah there's nothing you can do to offset that critics are uh, in my point of view critics a lot of critics are more popular than video game developers now and yeah or, or getting there and that kind of shifts the balance in in a way where you are completely dependent on these people like they've in in one sense they they do take on the kind of ability to market your games especially indie games like are heavily reliant on certain critics giving them an endorsement or a thumbs up i don't know that that's necessarily a healthy thing that critics are that popular that they can make or break the fate of a game but at the same time there's no alternative we need critics we need good criticism uh, and we need bad criticism also so i don't know that right. there's an alternative to what we have right now I haven't thought of it. I'm not sure uh like I agree with that because like pretty much everything like if you want to uh, distribute your game then like Steam is the person holding all the power. Obviously there are some reviewers that are more popular than others. So that's kind of the whole thing with like reaching to the masses, right? Like there's always somebody who is more powerful than anyone else and you have to get on their good side to 
but but a good reviewer your game or sell your a game good, that kind of stuff a good review arvind can get your game you know green light votes right a good word from yeah. shotgun or eurogamer can get your game green lit and on steam right no but it yeah can that up, is you know the amount of true, units you sell by a good 50000 to 100000 units i don't know that it's that much <laughs> that's i think an yeah, exact like yeah it could just like you know, throwing numbers out there no sure. but like the alternative here is that nobody reads rock paper shotgun and nobody votes on green lights so that i'm not sure I if the alternative, the alternative is better or not i don't know that that's the alternative i think i i don't know that the alternative is they'll have yeah, to so. be security but i don't yeah. think the, uh, the i don't think the option is what we have now where they are kind of focal points of the industry and their opinion matters yeah, to i'm me. not yeah i'm not sure i agree on that like uh, sure, for example it. most of the like most major game studios dictate how the discourse of their game takes place like if you have if you go in the triple a industry if you are an independent developer then obviously you have a lot less resources so the way your game gets out the word gets out is not entirely dependent on you if you have the if you are a major company then the balance of power is entirely focused towards you because you like arrange all the preview events you uh, sponsor all the expos and stuff you uh, manage how the information gets out yeah and like at the point even until the point where the game is out then you can easily continue pretending that what you have is a great game and not a bad game like example uh, aliens colonial marines but i think i do so, think that the backlash for big games that that do that is has become more and more severe which is a good thing i think when something like the sims comes out and says that we absolutely need drm for you to run this game yeah at the same time aliens colonial marines was like the top seller on steam when it launched so like all the like bad press i'm not sure well the bad press came after it launched before it launched it was getting yeah. excellent press right uh, all those people were yeah. so angry because they got they got hoodwinked by gearbox and sega there was yeah a bait and switch according to everyone involved like the players and the reviewers it was a bait and switch kind of they got shown one thing and what ship was another which is a great seg into the next piece of news that we're talking about which is a uh, dark matter uh, <laughs> uh you which, know uh, before we segue to that uh, i was just wondering what ashwin thought of this issue i'll just make this quick in some mm-hmm. some it up one line totally biscuit killed my first game thank you <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes and that let's not jump into that particular rabbit hole right now will 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 go down to yeah, yeah, that's kind of yeah that might get ugly like very quickly but yeah uh all right so uh, the seg which was perfect which they just ruined because he's a ruiner of all things that are good and pure in this world uh yes uh, the seg was to dark matter which got pulled off steam this week because a lot of people complained about the ending so like small blurb about dark matter and what happened with it for those of you who don't know Uh, Dark Matter is a side scroller made by a studio in England. One second, I have it written down. I have it written down. It's made by Interwave Studios and it's published by Iceberg Interactive. They launched a Kickstarter for the game, which failed, and uh, they had a demo at that point, which they had sent out to a bunch of uh, journalists and press, which had really impressed them. And a lot of people had written about the Kickstarter, but the Kickstarter. Uh, they, they weren't able to fund it successfully so they decided to take a risk once the kickstarter failed they decided to release what they had of the game and see what happened the problem was the game was pretty short at that point and it didn't have an ending so what they ended up releasing on steam with the hope that if it sells well they'll be able to continue it in an episodic format it didn't have any kind of narrative closure in fact it ends very abruptly uh. No I think yeah there is a bit of like a different perspective on this because like the ending like what what I read about it was that you literally enter a door and like the game is like to be continued and that was the point where which a lot of players didn't like and I think which is why steam and such removed the game like the initial description had no uh, reference to episodic content or like the first episode of a multiple series kind of thing it was yeah, just like okay. dark matter is Yeah, I was getting to that. They they didn't they never said uh, it was never specified in the description of the Steam game that the ending would be abrupt or that this wasn't a complete uh, beginning to end kind of narrative. Uh, it was never specified that they were planning to make the game episodic. The other thing that people didn't know was 
uh, no one was working on the game since the Kickstarter failed. Most of the team got laid off then, and uh, they just put out what they had and hoped for the best. Yeah, just a sad situation all around. Like, I mean, the Kickstarter failed, the devs got laid off, the game like wasn't finished, and now everyone is angry. So, like, like there's no, yeah, it's a very dark place. Yeah, it's a shitty, shitty situation. And the the saddest part is the game, from what I'm hearing, is not bad. It's, it's a game a lot of people are liking, except for the fact that it yeah is super abrupt, which which makes this even even worse. Games with shitty endings or games with endings that did not satisfy players seems to be a running theme today from Mass Effect to here. Uh, although I suppose Mass Effect pissed off a lot more people than Dark Matter ever did or ever will. Yeah, because more people were invested in it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose the Dark Matter stuff is not really something that... There's not really much to discuss over it. It's a pretty sad kind of episode. It's yeah, it's just kind of really sad to see that happen to devs. Especially... Yeah. You know, like you said, knowing that they made it a game that people liked, that's that's horrible. Yeah. But another thing about the industry is that once developers do get laid off or the company goes bankrupt, then even if somebody sells the game, developers don't get a penny. It's only the publishers who get yeah. the money. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. That, that's the funny part. As in, like that's the true. the developer fired everyone else except like two guys from management. So I don't know what they were managing after. They, well, like, I suppose the two guys from management are probably owners, kind of, the company, and so yeah. they're trying to see if they can get work or there's any way to keep things floating and they can... They were wanted to rehire the team, so their intentions yeah. were not entirely... Equal. And, yeah, and, the, like, the end of the situation is, like, the publisher saying that, like, this will be, uh, there will be added on content, but apparently an unrelated studio is developing now, which, which is, has no relation to the, the current studio, like... Yeah, it's going to be the same game apparently, but people completely unrelated. It's kind of a down note to end the podcast on. I suppose we can talk uh, about what we've been working on all week. Arvind, go. Yes, I've been working. Like I just finished uh, drafting chapter three of Unrest, which is like I think at the point where it's, it's like fifty oh, percent of the game. Yeah, so that's coming along nicely. And yeah, other than that's that, really you're good. not really uh, like this is supposed to be the chapter where you play as a yeah as a priest. You know. Uh, so, so, so yeah, this is supposed to be the halfway point of the game, and I guess there's another bit of news that the IGF entries have just ended, and like that's apparently what everyone is tweeting about, and like so some a bunch of for uh, IGF. No, like yeah, my, I might as well as wait till next year when it's finished. Okay, like, I'm not Phil Fish, like so I can win like every time. So might as well <laughs> oh. as just try one time, yeah. <laughs> Well, right. I would disagree. You, you, you do call yourself Desi Fish a lot, and you <laughs> like you threaten to kill yourself an, an inordinate amount of times. Yeah, but like I think that's that. Like, you are the only person on earth who's like who calls me like an Indian version of Phil Fish. Like you also yeah, call everyone yourself else just calls me a dick. Yeah. Ar- Arvind Desi Fish. Yeah, yeah, I failed to take the bait. I'll just kill myself now. Yeah, you should. Oh God! He made a fishing joke. He failed to take the. Oh fuck you, uh, man! Dude, oh. yes. You should you should start a you should start a Twitter handle. You know, Desi Fish. Hashtag you should start Desi a fish. podcast. I swear to God, which is nothing but you yeah. coming up with setups for Caruso rooming, removing yeah. his spectacles off. Yeah, and yeah, yeah I'll have... Miami. Oh God, please no. <laughs> yeah, I'll have two sock puppets in my hand. Like I'll call one of them Vivek and. The other one will be both Ashwin and Tejas, I guess. So, oh, just both of us in one it. sock puppet? Yeah, I don't have three hands, you know, so like that's the best I can do. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's not worth commenting. There's on. a penis joke to be made there, but I'm not I'm not able to come up exactly. with it off the cuff. All right. I'm just completely like this joke is flying over my head, like what you're saying. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh like on, on random <laughs> On a random note, <laughs> I had like the <laughs> most absurd uh, experience with uh, with Oblivion today. Uh, I was in Skingrad, and I think yeah, it was Skingrad. And there's this alchemist shop, and I forgot what the alchemist's name is. So I'm uh, talking to her, and what uh, there's like you know, one of the general options that you can ask anybody in the city is uh, one is rumors, and the other is just information about the city. So when I ask when I go to information about the city, the thing she asks me is, hey, 
and sh this is a Dunmer, by the way. Okay, so you know, uh, a draw elf or whatever. Uh, so she's like, "What is the fine for necrophilia in Tamriel?" <laughs> and, what? <laughs> exactly. She like she asked me, "What's the fine for necrophilia in Tam That's a Tamriel?" Very specific question. She was asking for a I friend. Three options. Like, it's better. Yeah. No, I think she, like three options, and like uh, the first is I don't know which case she's like, okay, never mind. The other is uh, you know why uh, why you want to know, and then she just blows it off saying, oh, I, was, I have a friend of a friend who was curious or something similar, you know, like just very non committed <laughs> But the third option is also, is where your where your answer is. It depends on if it's the first offense, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, that and then to that, what she says is, "Oh, well, uh, in that case, hypothetically, um, no." And that's it. That's the end of the conversation. There's, there's no. no there's, but I, I think there should be pick up line there. I, I'll play dead for you any day. Maybe, or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no option for why try the dead when you have the living right here. There's no cheesy pick up line no. there. There's there's no pickup lines in this game. Otherwise, that would have been the best opening ever. But it was hilarious. It was the most like I I I'm, I this was like at the end of like a five hour session where I'm just kind of you know starting to feel a little, feel a little tired. And all of a sudden, this pops out of nowhere, and I was just like, wow, holy crap, wow. <laughs> and this is not the first yeah. Dunbar who's talked about necrophilia. That's the thing. This is, I think, the second or third mention of a Dunmer and ne Necrophilia that have gone together. And I'm just like, you know, I'm wondering if there are more of these. I, I need to find out. Probably. It turns out all the quirky stuff yeah. hasn't kicked out of uh, the Elder Scrolls series yet. So let's, let's see. Anyway. The... <laughs> yeah, this might actually be a reference to something. Like, I'm not <laughs> sure. But yeah. yeah. Uh, so in, on, my, on my end, uh, I've been working on AI pathfinding this week. Uh, Essentially, just figuring out how to implement uh, pathfinding based on the nav mesh using Unreal. So I think I'm I'm almost done with that. So once that's done, I think I'll I'll have to start moving on to actually building a my my prototype in action so that people can start playing it and telling me how much I suck as a game designer. Arvind will be doing most of that. Just heads up to all of us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. I'll provide uh, back end support on that that uh, that count as well. Be like, yeah, Arvind, I'm not just so will sure. Be doing most of that. Uh, <laughs> so, all right, that's that's my update for this week. Uh, Ashwin, I don't think can talk about anything yet, right? I have a top secret project. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ashwin's working on a top secret project in Hyderabad. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's that's it for this week. We'll we'll see you next week. Good night, guys. Bye. 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 Tejas plays the oldest one. Yes, I do. The oldest. We've given up on planet. We've given up on planet side too. Mm. Yeah, they they stopped playing think, the moment I started. I don't think Arvind has it installed even anymore. Do you, Arvind? Uh, no, I don't think. Yeah, I asked you if I like I should like keep it in on my hard drive or not. Yeah, Tejas had started like, playing at that point, so I said you should uninstall it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah.